Thank you for tuning in. We at Greater New Point pray that your experience with us today is blessed and helpful. For more information about our ministry, please visit us at greaternp.org. Let's listen in. Amen, amen, and amen. Grace and peace be unto you in the knowledge of God our Father and Jesus Christ our Savior. Mama used to say it's another day's journey and I am indeed glad about it. We are excited and happy to have you worship with us on today. I am Pastor Darren Thompson, pastor of the Greatest Church in Irvington, New Jersey, the Greater New Point Missionary Baptist Church located here in the great township of Irvington, New Jersey. We again are excited to have you to worship with us today. Unfortunately, because of COVID and how it is just running rampant across our nation, uh, we decided for several weeks to worship virtually. Uh, prayerfully, we will be back in our sanctuary on next Sunday. But again, we are excited to have you worship with us on today on today amen but we want to open up with prayer and then we'll hear a uh, view a few announcements and at the same time hear our song for this morning but let's let's look to the lord in prayer gracious god our father we love you on today we thank you so much for being the sovereign god thank you for being gracious and merciful unto us on today god you, you've been good You've been good to us, God. You've, you've been, as they say, better than good. So, God, we thank you. Thank you for blessing us, God, and allowing us to see another day. Lord, we thank you that our last night was not our last night, but that we are alive and well. And, God, we are able to see our family and our friends. Thank you, God, for this awesome opportunity for us to worship you on this morning. And we pray, God, that although we are not currently in the building of our church god but we are worshiping together virtually for, for lord we are your church we are your people uh and god we thank you for this awesome opportunity now lord as we continue in our worship holy spirit have your way and i pray god that wherever we may be whether we are home or at work or in the car but that we will give your name glory honor, and praise in which you so rightly deserve God, we thank you and we give your name glory, honor, and praise. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Let every heart shout amen, amen, and amen. Let's prepare to view some of our updated announcements of events that will take place between now and uh, next month as well. And uh, we'll hear our song for this morning. Then I'll be back.
somebody and tell them that the blood still works. It it will never, never lose its power. Thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank God for his blood. Thank God for his sacrifice. Amen. Amen. Listen, let's, <clears throat> we want to um, ensure that we are maintaining uh, what the Lord has placed in our possessions. And we cannot do that without your help. We cannot do that without your help. As I mentioned on last week, we are a member funded church. We, we do not have other streams or avenues of income coming in as of yet. Amen. Those are things that will be, that are in the work. Uh, we're looking forward to having other streams of income. But we are a member funded church, which means, uh, again, we don't get income from anywhere else. And your participation, your love gifts uh, help us to uh, be sustained in our ministry. Um, we're asking and, and really looking forward and praying that you will be obedient to the Lord in your uh, sacrificial offering and your tithes. We have made uh, ways for you to give digitally. Amen. You can go to directly to, and the information should be on the screen. You should go to our website, Greater N P, that's G R E A T E R N P dot org, and click the Give Here tab. You'll be able to give your offering and your tithes uh, there. You can mail your gifts in to 60 Payne Avenue, Irvington, New Jersey, 07111. Or you can drop it off uh, on Sundays, Saturdays and Sundays between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. And someone will be there to receive your gift. Uh, we thank God for what you have done and the sacrifices you have made. Uh, God has been good to us. Even in the midst of a pandemic, we have been able to be sustained, to be sustained. While there are so many churches that have closed their doors, uh, thank God that we are not one and that God has sustained us and given us uh, what we need to uh, be able to see another another week, another Sunday. And uh, that's, uh, of course, big thanks to the Lord and thanks to you. So we're asking, please, please pause at this moment Amen. Pause at this moment. And if you have the, the abilities to give digitally, go to our website, greaternp.org. Uh, click the Give Here tab and you'll be able to give directly to our church. Amen. We want to prepare hearts and minds to worship the Lord uh, through the preach word. But before that we do that, as you saw in our announcements, we are prayerfully uh, and eagerly looking for it. I miss you. I miss you, haven't seen you yet this year, amen. And uh, our last service in our sanctuary uh, was the Sunday before Christmas. That was third Sunday in December. And I am looking forward to seeing your face and for us to worship and to fellowship uh, safely together uh, back in our building. Uh, if the numbers are still up, uh, we will not be entering back into our building. So. Look out for information this week via a text message uh, in regards to uh, next steps in, for next Sunday. Let's prepare to worship the Lord uh, in, through the preach word. Amen. Amen. Keeping, uh, I want to go back the last time I've had some weeks off. I had two weeks off uh, and I did not preach to you. We had several guests to come in the second Sunday and third Sunday of last month. Um, and the last time I stood before you and physically preached uh, was uh, the, the first Sunday in December. Uh, we left off. We're in our series on stewardship, uh, the eight T's of stewardship. 
uh, time, talent, treasures, tongue, t uh, temple, uh, testimony, thanksgiving. Uh, and I'm sure I'm leaving one out. Um, and uh, temperament. And we left off uh, preaching and discussing uh, the stewardship of our testimony. I want to pick up back there. Uh, we actually preached uh, Psalm 1. Psalm 1 verse 1 was the last uh, place we actually preached. So I want to actually go back there and look at Psalm 1. We left off at verse 1. I want to pick up at verse 2 on today. But let's pray first. Oh God, I pray that you are pleased with the posture of our worship. We thank you, God, for this awesome opportunity to hear your word. Please help us now to live better lives. Uh, the, the, the testimony of our lives, God. Someone can just look at us and see us and know that we belong to you, that we are doing and striving the best that we can to live righteous, righteously. Now give me your presence and power to declare the truth of Jesus Christ. And I pray, God, God that someone who is under the sound of my voice that do not know Christ as their Savior may come into a saving faith with him. Bless us now and keep us. I commit this as an act of worship unto thee. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Amen. Psalm. I want to read verse 1 and then verse 2. Amen. Psalm 1 beginning at verse 1 and I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. Therein the reading is this, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. I want to keep saying theme or topic of what we preached uh, first Sunday in December, uh, and that is the stewardship of our testimony, the stewardship of our testimony. I think it's imperative and important for us to talk about this because there are many who uh, I'm sure have made re New Year's resolutions and uh, some have uh, kept them and some have already broken them nine days into the new year. Uh, but I think it's imperative and important for us to talk about uh, the stewardship of our testimony, because if we are to be serious about our walk with Christ, not only is it imperative and serious for us uh, to ensure that we are living as godly and as righteous as, our, as we possibly can, but there are others who are looking and viewing your life uh, and uh, who you are, uh, how you live. Uh, some folk will never pick up a Bible. Some folk will never come to church. And the only Bible that someone will ever see is how you live. So I think it's important uh, that uh, we deal with the testimony, the stewardship of our testimony. Amen. So let's dig into this this text. Amen. And I desire your prayers. Uh, as always, I love to give illustrations to open up uh, the sermon. It's like a window to, to the text. Um, there was a group of tourists that traveled together throughout Europe, uh, where various and great and historic Christian events took place. But then they arrived at an unassuming village and found an old man sitting along the roadside. In a condescending way, one of the tourists asked the old man, Old man, have there ever been any great Christians that were born here? Or have any great Christians been born here? In which the old man replied back by saying, no great Christians has ever been born here, only babies. <laughs> In the same sense, church, no child of God is born again with a full sense of Christian maturity. 
there, there is no such a thing as going from being a babe in Christ to becoming a super saint overnight. All of us, all of us who are were born again, that are in Jesus Christ, all of us that were born again, were born spiritual babes that had to grow up and have the opportunity to grow up into spiritual maturity. The late great Bishop J.C. Ryle, he says, gradual growth in grace, growth in knowledge, growth in faith, growth in love, growth in holiness, growth in humility, growth in spiritual mindedness. He says, all of this I see clearly taught and urged in scripture and clearly exemplified in the lives of many of God's saints. But sudden, instantaneous leaps from conversion to consecration, he says, I fail to see in the Bible. In other words, church, this Christian journey, this Christian life that we live, it's not a sprint, but it's a marathon. You do not become an overnight sensational spiritual giant in the faith within moments, within months, and even years after your conversion. But all of us who desire to live a life that is, that is pleased to do the will of God and, let me pause, and those that want to ensure that their testimony is one that's pleasing to God and pleasant to other people, hear me, must grow up in the word of God. Amen. Uh, uh, to live a life that testifies I belong to Christ. Watch, that will only happen when we grow and obey the will and the word of God. Watch me. Spiritual growth is a process. Spiritual growth, I'm sorry for that background noise. Spiritual growth is a process. I believe the, the, the doctrinal term that, that God uses is, is called sanctification. Sanctification is the state of proper functioning. It, it's, it's literally to, to set a person or people or that thing apart for its intended use by the designer. So watch, sanctification includes all aspects of the life of the believer. It's, it's a synonym for salvation. It's the, the critical work of the Holy Spirit at conversion, whereby we are set apart, whereas we are born of the Spirit. And once that has taken place, the Holy Spirit, watch, he don't leave us and go on to someone else. Mm -mm. He, he doesn't leave us to work out our own salvation, but the Holy Spirit continues to work in us and to make us more and more like Christ. So in other words, he is continually conforming us into the image of God's son by producing internal transformation on the inside. But we will never grow up spiritually if we don't allow the Holy Spirit to do his work in our life. I've said this to you before, I'll say it again. It is the will of God to have the Spirit of God use the Word of God to make the children of God look like the Son of God. Amen, that's good. Let me say that again. It is the will of God to have the Spirit of God use the Word of God to make the children of God look like the Son of God. Amen. Amen. Let me 
briefly recap what we went over in in verse one uh, last last month. As I said last month, Psalm one is an ocean of truth with just a teaspoon of words. As a matter of fact, the inscription above Psalm one says the way of the righteous and the end of the ungodly. Psalm 1 give a contrast of the way, the lifestyle, the testimony of the one that tries their best to live righteously, and it gives the peril, the end of those that live ungodly. Again, in Psalm 1, we encounter what the life of a believer, watch, a believer that's trying to live as righteous and as godly as possible, we encounter what that life look like. In verse one, we observe the practice of the one that grows, the practice of the one that grows. And now in verse two, we will observe the passion of the one that grows, the passion of the one that grows. Again, last month we dealt with verse one where we saw the practice of the one that grows in, in the practice of the one that uh, uh, grows and walks righteously. How does that happen? Good question. It happens because he separates himself from the world. He separates himself from the behavior of the world. How does he do that? By not walking in the counsel of the ungodly. Look at it, verse one. There are several things he says there in verse one. Verse one says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, right? Nor stand in the path of the sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful, right? So that's how we do it. Uh, first, he doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. I told you before, the counsel of the ungodly just simply means the advice of the, the uh, morally unstable folks. It, it's, a, it's a general term that describes the world view of those who do not know Jesus Christ as savior. It speaks to those who conduct their lives as if God don't exist right? As if God don't exist. That's the counsel of the ungodly. But he also does it by not standing in the path of sinners, right? He, by not standing in the, the, the path of sinners refers to their way of life or their way of behavior. It's to stand in the path of sinners, which simply means, watch, that you are involving yourself with sinful activity with those who don't know or believe in Jesus Christ. It's, it's, it's a progression, right? Again, you go from walking to now, they done got your attention and you are now standing there and participating to a degree and look at the last part, it says not only are we not to walk in the counsel of the ungodly not or stand in the path of sinners, but now you are now sitting in the seat of the scornful or the mockers. The seat of the scornful refers to the assembly place. It's, it's the hangout spot where sinners like to gather or to, to mock and to scorn and to ridicule other people. And this is what the text is simply saying. It, it's simply saying, if you want to ensure that you have a testimony that upholds and uplifts Jesus Christ, you have to separate yourself from the world by not walking in the counsel of the ungodly, not standing in the path of sinners, and not sitting in the seat of the scornful. Hear me, the, the one who cares about what their testimony looks like. If you care about what your testimony look like to other people, then you won't uh, believe like the wicked, you won't behave 
like the wicked and you sure enough will realize that you don't belong with the wicked. And this is why, beloved, we have to watch our testimony. We have to watch our testimony. But that was the practice of the one that grows. That was the practice of the one that grows. Today, I want to deal with the passion of the one that grows. Verse two, verse two says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates, he meditates day and night. What is the passion of the one that grows? What is the passion of the one that grows? It, it's simply this. It's, it's the word of God. The passion of the one that grows, it's, it's the word of God. Hear me, church. The one that grows up spiritually, they understand that you cannot live life disconnected from the word of God. Let me say that again. The one that grows up spiritually understands that you cannot live life disconnected from the word of God, nor can you live life without having, hear me, without having a healthy intake of the word of God. Yeah. Uh, Thomas Guthrie says, um, the Bible is an armory of heavenly weapons. It says it's a laboratory of infallible medicines, a mine in the mine of exhaust of exhaustless wealth. He says it's a guidebook for every road, it's a chart for every sea, it's a medicine for every malady, and it's a bomb for every room, every wound. He says, robbers of our Bible in our skies has lost its son. I agree with that. You cannot make it in this life without having the word of God. The writer of Psalm 1 here says two things about the word of God in this verse in order for us to have a strong and good testimony. He says two things there in the text. First, he says delight, and then he says meditate. Delight and meditate. When you look at that word delight, um, that word delight, it, it's a masculine noun, which means to take pleasure in or find enjoyment in something. It's, it's a high degree of gratification or or satisfaction of the mind. It is to feel great favor towards something or to experience emotional uh, delight. Um, one of my favorite meals, I'm gonna have uh, some of it today. One of my favorite meals that First Lady makes um, is baked macaroni and cheese and her fried chicken. Now, she's not making fried chicken, I got something else today. But her baked macaroni and cheese. And when she makes um, my plate, she makes sure I, I get a whole bunch of macaroni and cheese and, and I see all food, no plate. <laughs> That's how I got this gut. And, and when I begin, don't y'all laugh too hard at me now. And, and when I begin to eat, because I love what I'm eating so much, trust and believe it, it brings great pleasure. I mean, you can see it all on my face. I don't rush through my meal but I literally take my time, watch, I take my time and I savor every moment and every piece of what I'm eating. I don't care how long it takes me to get through it. I don't care how full I may get. I do my best to eat all of what I can because that and what I am eating, I love it just that much. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I become a little too full, I unbuckle my my belt, loosen my pants, pull up my shirt, I put my fork down, I sit back for a little while and, and watch what I just ate. I sit back for a little while because what I just ate, what I just took in, I just want to make sure it properly digests, watch, so that I can get some more later. Yep. 
And this is what the psalmist is saying here in the text. He's saying, church, that you have to get to that point in your spiritual life that the word of God becomes so good to you that you hate to put it down. It becomes so good to you that all you can crave, watch, all you can crave is not junk food, not gossip, not hatred, not lies, not secularism, not stuff that will satisfy your flesh, but all you can crave and have a taste for is nothing but the word of God. And perhaps that's the reason why some people can't grow up spiritually and have a good testimony. It could be that they have an unhealthy appetite for the wrong. They have, they have bags of envy and double doses of deceit and sliders of slander and big gulps of cussing and supersized cups of lust and side orders of hypocrisy. And watch, all of that stuff is making you unfit for Christian growth and unfit to be a true witness for Jesus Christ. It's damaging the stewardship of our testimony. And we can never get to the finish line of Christianity by being sinfully unfit and unhealthy. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily ensnare us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Watch, beloved, you cannot have a longing and a craving for the word of God if you are going to let sin dominate your life. Let me say that again. You cannot have a longing and a craving for the word of God. If you're going to let sin continue to dominate your life. I used to hear the old saints, old saints say, either the word of God will keep you from sinning or sinning will keep you from the word of God. <laughs> you cannot delight. You cannot crave the word of God while allowing sin to die or better yet, I'll say it the way Peter says it in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Peter says, therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and, and, and evil speaking, he says, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted the goodness or the graciousness of the Lord. Watch. For those of us that are parents, when it's dinner time and your child comes to the table without an appetite, it's either one of three things that, that happen. Either they're sick, either they don't like what's being served, or they've been eating junk food all day long. I suggest, I suggest for some believers, it's a combination of all three. Watch. Peter says in verse 1, in chapter 1, verses 2 and 2, he says, As newborn babe craves the milk of the word. Uh, newborn babes, watch. Newborn babes don't want your car. They don't want you. They don't care about the, the president of the United States. They don't care about how much money they have. They don't care about the clothes that it, but. All the, that baby cares about and craves for is milk. Milk. That's it. I don't know about you, but have you ever heard a hollering baby that's hungry for some milk? That baby will make you regret that you have ears to hear because that baby will holler until it gets some milk. Baby don't care about how late it is. Baby don't care how early it is in the morning. It could be four o'clock in the morning. And if that baby is craving or it's hungry for some milk, it will holler until it get what it wants. That's the point of the text. That's the point of the text and what I'm pushing. That's how we ought to be, church, when it comes to the word of God. We ought to crave it. 
We ought to want it all day. We want to want it every day. And, and watch, watch, watch. And when we don't get the milk of the word, we should be cranky just like that baby. <laughs> You get cranky when you don't get enough sleep. You get cranky when you don't have your early morning cup of joe. You ought to also be cranky and upset when you not when you don't spend time in the word of God. We have to delight in the word. But watch. It's not just enough to delight in the word of God, but we must move from delighting in the word to also putting it into practice, putting it into practice. We have to put into practice that in what we took in. Hmm? A.W. Tozer says in his book on leadership, he says, the Bible recognizes no faith that does not lead to obedience, nor does it recognize any obedience that does not spring forth from faith. He says the two are at opposite sides of the coin. We, we, we as believers, we are the delight in the word and of the word, and that shall lead us to doing what the word of the Lord says. Hmm? We ought to obey that in what we have heard. Um, dinner was done, and little Johnny's mother yelled out the window for Johnny to come to come eat. But as little Johnny approached the yard, his mother kindly said to him, "Johnny, listen, go come through come through the front door because your father just painted the back porch." But Johnny just kept on walking promising his mother he'll be careful. Johnny, go through the front door because your father just painted the porch and the porch is still wet. Mom, I promise I'll be careful. And in the middle of Johnny talking, his mother with a stern voice said, Johnny, stop. Go through the front door because your father just painted the porch. Johnny, I don't want your carefulness, I want your obedience. Hear me, because a lot of us need to understand that going into this year of 2022, because too many of us are trying to be careful when God wants us to be obedient. If you want life to be better, stop trying to be careful in your disobedience to God. God don't want your carefulness, he wants your obedience. He wants your obedience. Amen. All right, let's get to our last point. Not only should you delight, but you should also meditate. You should also meditate. It says here in the text, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law, he meditates. Watch, he meditates both day and night. Uh, yeah, know I love words. I love words. Um, this word meditate um, simply means the act of, of focusing one's thoughts. It, it means to, to think upon, to, to ponder. Um, meditation has the idea of digesting something thoroughly um, or, or going over it in your mind repeatedly and, and slowly. In Hebrew thinking, to meditate on scripture is to quietly repeat the word of God in a soft sound, droning sound while, uh, while also watch, abandoning outside distractions. Again, in, in Hebrew thinking, to meditate on scripture is to quietly repeat the word of God in the soft sound while abandoning outside distractions. It, it's, a, it's a traditional Jewish prayer called davening, which, which is, is simply to recite the text praying intensely intensely in getting lost in communion with God while they are rocking back and forth. 
That's that's called dabbling. I, I'm not sure if they still do this practice today, but in the life of every believer, it ought to be practiced in some kind of way. There ought to be some sense in which we get lost in our communion, in our fellowship with God when we begin to meditate on his word. When we meditate on the word, watch, we allow the spirit of God within us to digest the word of God for us. Let, let, me, let me give you a picture of what I said in regard, because the spirit of God within us will begin to digest the word of God for us. Let me give you a picture. It's, it's similar to uh, those that grew up on the farm. Um, it's similar to a cow chewing her cud, right? Um, my granddaddy taught me that a cow has have several compartments in his stomach. And what the cow does, it goes out in the morning, she, it grazes on the grass. And when the dew is still on the grass, that's when the cow goes out uh, in the cool of the day. Then when it, when it becomes hot, uh, too hot in the middle of the day, what, what the cow does is she lie down under a tree and she began to do what's called chewing the cud. Now, chewing the cud is when the cow moves the grass <laughs> that she ate in the morning, she moves it back up in her mouth and she begins to chew it. She begins to go over it again. And this is what the writer here is telling us to do today. He's telling us through that, to, that throughout the day, in order to safeguard uh, ourselves from becoming overburdened by the world, right? And to ensure that we have a good testimony, what the writer is saying is we need to be like that cow. We need to chew the cud. We need to meditate on the word of God both day and night. Watch. Don't just read the word of God as if it's something on your to-do list. Right? Don't just do it in the morning as a devotional. Mm -mm. God is more than just a morning time devotional God. But every day, all day, we should be meditating on the word of the noontime, 10 o'clock in the morning, while you're sitting at your desk, while you're doing your job. A text ought to come up in your mind. Right? So, again, what when it comes to the word of God or whatever it is that you hear, because just like your body, too much grease, too much fat, uh, too much sugar, all of that stuff will affect your body. And what, it's same thing in your mind, whatever you have as an intake of your mind, whatever you bring into your mind is what's going to shape your thinking and what shapes your thinking is what's going to shape your life. Proverbs chapter 23 verse 7 says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So again, whatever shapes your thinking will also shape your life. And that's the point of the text delighting in the word of God or the lead to meditating on the word of God and meditating on the word of God ought to lead to transformation. Let me say that again. The lighting of the word of God should lead to meditate, med meditating on the word of God and meditating on the word of God ought to lead to transformation because of the word of God. I'm done. Verse three, here's the trans transformation. The trans transformation. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also should not wither and whatever he does will prosper. Again, Delighting in the word of God leads to meditation. Meditating on the word of God and meditating on the word of God leads to transformation. 
Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, he says, Brethren, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How, Paul? By the renewing of your mind that you may prove that what is good and acceptable, perfect will of God. Paul makes it clear here, church, that you can't live like a Christian until, hear me, until you first learn how to think like a Christian. You cannot live like a child of God until you first learn how to think like a child of God. And if we are not renewing our mind, so that we are transformed, we'll conform to that in what we surround ourselves with. So we'll end up conforming to what the world does. We'll end up conforming to what our ungodly friends does. And there's no possible way that we can go God's way and the world's way at the same time. It, it just won't happen. You can't you can't run with the rabbits and hunt, hunt with the hounds at the same time. It just won't happen. In like manner, we cannot be conformed to this world and meditate on the word of God both day and night by living our life ungodly, by not conforming to what the word of God says. True growth, beloved, I'm done. True growth only happens by delighting and meditating in the word of God. That's how it's happened. That's how it happens. That's how we have a life and a stewardship, a testimony that is accountable unto God. It, it happens by us delighting in the word, meditating in the word, and obeying the word. I'm done. John Piper says, you cannot fight graduate level sin with grammar school knowledge of God. Let me say that again. You cannot fight graduate level sin with grammar school knowledge of God. You cannot expect a change in your life if you know more of what's happening in the world than you do what's happening in the Bible. Shouldn't be. There shouldn't be an imbalance. We, we can only walk in the word of God by ensuring that we delight and that we meditate in the word of God all day, every day. Let me say it every day, every day. And that's not to say that we don't have a life to live. We have a life to live, but it is to say that our life is controlled and led by what the word of God says by what the word of God says. We, we, we panic because of COVID, because that's all we've heard, COVID, COVID, COVID. And there's, there's definitely areas for great concern for COVID. But the word of God lets us know that God is sovereign and that he is in control of all things. And when you live according to what the word says, COVID, cancer, mean, evil people, won't affect you because you are meditating. You are delighting. You are chewing the cud of the word of God. I pray that that word was helpful unto you. Allow the message in the word of God to meditate into your heart. If you be one who do not know Christ as your savior, please accept Christ into your life. All it takes is for you to believe that he is the son of God, that God has raised him from the dead, that he is sitting the right hand of the father. And one day he will be coming back soon. If you believe that you are saved, please visit our website, greaternp.org, complete the connection card, and we would love to talk with you and to minister unto you. Until we meet again, may God bless you. May God keep you. May heaven smile upon you. Let's keep all of our announcements in mind. Amen. And let's continue to pray for all of our sick and shut in and pray for our church, pray for our world. I love you. 
I love you. I love you and look forward, if it be the Lord's will, look forward to seeing you on next Sunday. God bless. Thank you for worshiping with us. For more information about our ministry, visit us at www.greaternp.org. May God bless you.